We should continue the lesson in uh, Romans 4. We're talking about um, what it means for righteousness to be counted to somebody. And uh, we're talking about Abraham in particular in this place. And the, I guess the point of our study in Romans is to understand the real meaning of the passage or of the letter, I guess, how that we are making a distinction between the law of Moses and the law of Christ, it is all too often misunderstood as a distinction between uh, commandment keeping and faith. That is false. The world has made that up and imposed that view on the letter. It's not saying any such thing, and there's nothing in the Bible that puts those things at odds. Um, Everything in the Bible indicates that your faith is proven by your works. So Romans is really talking about ancient Israel, uh, the law of Moses, as opposed to what is available to us in the covenant in Christ Jesus, the the new law. One of the things that we read about here, which is a little bit technical, and so I beg your indulgence on it, but hopefully it's not so bad, is verse 3 of Romans 4. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. This word for it was counted to him is actually a very important word. It is used many times in the New Testament, and it's used especially in Romans chapter 4. It's clear that this is what Romans 4 is is talking about. The whole point of this chapter is that what it, whatever that is, we're going to talk about it. This counted to him. And uh, the reason for that is because of verse uh, 24. It will be counted to us. That's the whole point here. If you you just walk away with two things, (laughs) or, or with one thing, that's the one thing. These are the bookends on this chapter saying the reckoning of righteousness, the figuring of righteousness, the, the, it, how is it being counted? It will be, it was counted to him. It will be counted to us too. That's the point. So let's talk about the counting. This is a word that um, is a technical word for numerical calculation. It is about counting uh, or reckoning or calculating something, uh, the word for reckon here or, or for counted. So some have said it is an accounting term. I think that that's true, but it's more than that. It's just anything to do with arithmetic, really. Um, but then it is also used in, I suppose, uh, ways that we might call comparisons. So. It's a way of setting down to somebody's account, as in crediting them. Uh, you know, even without reference to numbers, it means something like taking, taking it into account or calculating about something, considering something. Uh, it can also mean that you count on something or expect it. You calculate that this is what's going to happen or you reckon so. Uh, it also eventually comes to have with it the idea of to make a conclusion by reasoning. Um, you know, your, your calculations lead you to a conclusion as you think about a thing. Well, this is the word that is used in, uh, in uh, Romans 4, verse 3. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, meaning it was credited, perhaps you would say, put into his righteousness column in the accounting book. Um, That's one way of talking about it, I think. But I think what it really is getting at is that God considered him to be righteous. Because he believed God, God considered him righteous. This is almost like saying, you know, we expect that he is going to do what is right because he has believed in God. It's like 
you know, in the absence of contrary evidence, we believe that this man is a righteous man. Um, that's the idea, is this reckoning or this counting. I don't think it's so much about crediting it to his account, uh, although that's one way of looking at it. I think he's saying God considered him righteous. And if that sounds to you a little bit um, conditional or like, you know, maybe preliminary, well, that's because of what James said. You see, you know, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? His faith was completed. Uh, and I'm quoting James 2. If you want to turn there with me, that's probably a good idea. James 2, 20 to 24. Do you want to be shown, foolish person? Faith apart from works is useless. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Okay, so James is very clear. The scripture or um, the faith is completed by his works. The scripture or what was written that says he believed God and, and he was considered righteous was fulfilled when he offered his son Isaac. So yeah, God considered him righteous, but in some sense he's untested. When he was tested to offer his son, he passed the test. He was proven, if you will. And then the scripture has its fulfillment. Meaning God was right about him. He, he, was, he is righteous. So that's really what we're saying there. And Paul's focus is to say that we can do the same thing without the law of Moses. And Hebrews 11 is another place I want to go when we talk about the definition, the reckoning. Hebrews 11, um, 17, 18, 19, also about Abraham, also about offering Isaac. It says, by faith Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it had been said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Well, he uh, considered or reckoned that God was able to raise him from the dead. And that's our word for counted as. Maybe you would say, well, he credited God with the ability to raise him from the dead. That's reasonable. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Yes, that's a different argument for a different time. But for now, he reckoned God was able to raise him from the dead. He who, th this is the son of promise, the son of his old age. He's going to offer him, e even though you would think, why would you do this? After everything hinges upon this child. Well, because God said to do so. And so he must be going to raise him from the dead. And as Paul said in another place, why should it be thought impossible that God raises the dead? <laughs> That's a very reasonable conclusion. But it's a conclusion. He thought about it. He figured, hmm, well, one way of thinking about that is, well, God's lying to me. Uh, or that he's not trustworthy. Or that, you know, I've been deselected. I've done something and now it's going to be taken away from me. Right? But hmm, he didn't opt for any of those. He went with, oh, God can raise him from the dead. Nothing's impossible for him. And that's a good thing to go with. <laughs> Nothing's impossible for God. That's true. So move, you know, go onward. 
uh, it compares to the 19th verse of Romans 4, and we can go back to Romans 4 now, but it's like Romans 4, 19, where it says that, that Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. That's our same word, that reckoning or counting. When he thought about or reckoned or considered his own body and Sarah's womb, you know, this did not make his faith waver. And we know that his faith didn't waver when he offered up Isaac either. He really believed in God. He was really just, which is righteous. All right. So we're back in Romans 4. And that just to give us the idea, I mean, the, the definition there, I, that's what we're saying. And, and it's, you know, it's a fairly simple point, but I think it needs to be said because much more complicated points have been made out of this. And unfortunately, a lot of bad points have been made about it. Uh, this is what we're talking about is that, well, God considered him righteous. He hadn't been tested yet. And James 2 handles that problem. When he is tested, his faith is completed by his works, and the scripture that said it was counted righteousness was fulfilled. Done. So if we're not talking about whether we have to obey God, or whether salvation is by faith alone, what are we talking about? Right. That's why we go back to Romans 4. What we are talking about is verse 1, what shall we say was gained by Abraham? What is the point of being a descendant of Abraham? That's what we're saying. Is it about being a nation? a people, an ethnicity, a, a race, a culture? Or is it about something else? That's all we're getting at. Again, verse 3 talks about it was counted to him righteousness. Verse 4 says a person who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Right. Your paycheck does not have charitable contribution to you it is your pay it's salary <laughs> that's all but to the one who doesn't work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted as righteousness this person when we say he's not working we don't mean that he fails to obey God we just mean he hadn't offered Isaac his son yet, but God considered him righteous. If in some sense God trusted him, then he really was faithful. That's all we're getting at. It's not saying to the person who disobeys, uh, no, God has never justified people who disobey. This one is being blessed at the time that he believes in God because he believes in God. And David speaks of the same thing, the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Again, what kind of righteousness is it? It's the seventh verse. Or I'm sorry, what kinds of uh, what kind of apart from works? Excuse me, not the righteous, it's the apart from works. What kind of apart from works is it? Apart from what works? It's verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. This is not the word for an outlaw, uh, somebody disobedient. It means people who are doing things that are outside the law of Moses. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. It's forgiveness. It's grace. That's all. Which is real and which is true. But the question again is verse 9. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? 
this is the real question. The question is not faith or works. That's a, again, that's a false dichotomy. The question is, Jew or Gentile? And the answer is Gentile. It's for everybody. But that's why we ask, is it only for the circumcised or for the uncircumcised too? Well, that's why we're talking about the counting. How is it counted? That's verse 10. How then was it counted to him? When did he get counted righteous? And how was that counted? Before or after circumcision? Because circumcision is the first mark of the law of Moses. It wasn't after, but before he was circumcised. That it was counted. He was counted righteous before he took the first step, if you will, in the law of Moses, the circumcision. Which comes down to 11. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while still uncircumcised. And let me pause here again. A little bit of a, an aside on this, but I think a very important one. That when people are studying this thinking that it's about faith and works or faith and obedience. They read this and they see, well, circumcision is after the fact, a seal of righteousness he already had by faith. And they're thinking this means you're already a child of God when you believe before you are baptized. That's what they think it means. It's not what it means. It means you are already a child of God without having gone through the law of Moses. But I, again, the reason it's an aside is because I've seen all too many brethren try to argue out of this verse and say, well, it's, it's not telling us that he was already right before he had been circumcised. Well, yes, it is. It certainly is telling us that. But they, they're they avoiding it because they think that if they allow someone to say that, then, well, now they have an excuse to not be baptized. No, there's nothing in this chapter that says anything about baptism. It's about the law of Moses. And yes, when you believe in Jesus, you are saved. When you believe in him, you are saved without becoming a Jew. You are baptized in the name of Jesus. You are raised from the water, a new creature created in him. That makes you saved. And you have never, you don't have to have been circumcised or eaten kosher or any of the other things that are part of the law of Moses. You are righteous already in God's eyes. Credited righteous, if you like, reckoned righteous, whatever you want to go with in the same way that Abraham was considered or reckoned righteous before the law of Moses, you also are reckoned righteous apart from the law of Moses. That's all that this is saying. So don't try to make it say something it doesn't say in verse 11. Yes, it's a seal of the righteousness he already had by faith while still uncircumcised. That is true. Now, when people say, well, baptism is just a seal of the righteousness you already had by faith alone. No, it doesn't say that here or anywhere else. There's nothing in scripture that leads you to that. You made that up. This is talking about the law of Moses. Why was it done that way? Why was it reckoned to him before circumcision? It was, verse 11, to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness could be counted to them as well. That means we also are considered righteous by God in the same way that Abraham was considered righteous by God apart from and without regard to the law of Moses. That's it. He was counted righteous before the law was introduced so that it would be clear that all the world is counted righteous through him by the faith that he had, not by this one line with, 
you know, with the law of Moses that comes afterwards. It isn't. You know, when we say, what shall we say was gained by our father Abraham? Verse 1. It's not about culture and tradition, heritage and genealogy, you know, a race, a nation. No, it's about the faith that he had in God. The favor that he had with God. If we skip a little bit. We mentioned earlier the 19th verse. But I want to pick it a little bit there at the 18th verse. Romans 4, 18, and we'll go down from there. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Against hope, I mean, there was no expectation. Nobody would have expected this. That's all it means. Who expects to father many nations at a hundred years of age? But he believed what God told him, and so he hoped against hope that he would become the father of many nations, as he was told. He did not weaken in faith, that is to say, in his trust of what God said, when he considered his own body good as dead, since he was about a hundred, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, which she had been barren before. Now she is barren and almost as old as he is. As, you know, as the crow flies, this is impossible. But nothing will be impossible with God. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. He grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced God was able to do what he had promised. That is why, verse 22, his faith was counted to him righteousness. That's why he was considered righteous, because he believed God, who told him something that you would think is impossible. That's a good reason to think that he's faithful. That's a good reason to think that he's righteous. When God tells you something that God knows is impossible, but you trust God enough that you know he can do the impossible and that's not an issue. That's a good reason to think that you're just. Isn't that really the crux of belief? I mean, when it gets down to it, isn't that the bottom line of belief? We believe that God raises the dead. We believe that God exists and that he you know, rewards people who seek him and he punishes people who fail to seek him because there's prodding, there's evidence in the world that he is there and that he ought to be sought out. That he raised Jesus from the dead is impossible, but nothing will be impossible with God. That he created the world from nothing is impossible, but nothing will be impossible with God. This is the crux of faith, isn't it? These are the people, if you will, who really believe God. They really trust God. That's the whole point. When you are a Christian, you are the person who believes that God is trustworthy, no matter how unlikely what he tells you seems to be. There is a judgment coming. Uh, the sufferings here will be worth it. All the different things that are there. If you believe God or you trust him that he's telling you the truth and that this is right and this is what's best for you in this short time on earth, then you become a Christian and you live faithfully. That's the kind of faith that Abraham had. That's why his faith was counted righteousness. But the words, 23, back to our study, it was counted to him. 
Those words were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in the one who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And continue with me, if you will, to the first and second verses of chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Again, verse 1 of chapter 5, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the therefore. You know, again, uh, Romans uh, yeah, 5, 1 and 2 really belong with chapter 4. I like, you know, if you're the kind of person that writes down in your Bible, you should, you should cross out 1 and 2 here and make them Romans 4, 26 and 27. <laughs> Because that's what they are. They go with the above. And what they're saying is, our justification came not by the law. It came by faith. We have been justified by faith the same way that Abraham was justified by faith. Therefore, we have peace with God. Not through Moses. Through Jesus, our Lord. That's what he's saying. That's the bottom line. We have the same faith that Abraham had. That is how he was counted righteous, not the law of Moses. And now we are also counted righteous in the same way he was. We are reconciled to God. We're forgiven. And it's in Christ Jesus the Lord, not in Moses. That's the conclusion. And in Romans 6, I'll turn your attention in closing, verses 9 through 12. This word for reckoning gets used again. Not very often, you know, chapter 4 has a bunch of them. There are hardly any uses elsewhere. There are some. And here's one of them, verse, or, uh, chapter 6, beginning at about verse 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he now lives, he lives to God. So you also must reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. That's fairly plain. This Jesus, raised from the dead, never dies again. He has the power of life. And we also, Romans 6, 11, must consider ourselves dead to sin. We should be reckoning, you know, God reckons us righteous, but we should be reckoning as well. We reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And we do not let sin reign in the mortal body to obey its passions. We present our bodies a living sacrifice to obey God in faith. So that's the end of Romans 4. We are going to keep going with this, I hope, but not right now. Today, if you realize that you are not yet a Christian because you have not taken the necessary steps of obeying God and baptism for forgiveness of sins. Well, we have water. Uh, we have every willingness to help you to obey the gospel of Jesus before it is too late. You might have forgiveness from him. And yes, it's by grace. Nobody ever earned anything by getting dunked in water. That's still grace. You're obeying God. He graciously is forgiving you of everything that you've done in the past. It's way better than our legal system. You are forgiven. You are clean. You are heaven bound. Oh, well, there may still be some consequences. Yeah, that's life. Thorns and thistles. <laughs> and who can argue? We deserve them. 
but God will forgive and there is heaven to look forward to. If today you need to obey the gospel, let that need be known by coming to the front while we stand and while we sing the song selected.